Thank you for this morning. Thank the Lord for everyone's presence and pray that uh, he would be with us in our time of worship this morning. Uh, we have one announcement. I'm sure we've all received emails, but uh, Rob and Deb are going to have a barbecue at their place uh, Thursday evening, 6 o'clock. And uh, please respond if you can come to either Robert Debbie and uh, let them. For our call to worship, turn in our Bibles to Psalm number 20. <laughs> read Psalm 20, and I'll ask the question, have you ever had a day of trouble? Have you ever had a time where you needed protection? Have you ever had a time where you needed support? Have you ever had time when the only one you can turn to is God? Well, our psalm this morning is about that very thing, it's about prayer. And David uh, is very <coughs> professional in this psalm about the benefits of prayer and the need of it in our whole life. So let's begin reading Psalm 20. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. May the name of the God of Jacob protect you. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you support from Zion. May he remember all your offerings and regard with favor your burnt sacrifices. May he grant you your heart's desire and fulfill all your plans. May we shout for joy over your salvation, and in the name of our God, set up our banners. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed. He will answer him from his holy heaven with the saving might of his right hand. Some trust in chariots and some in horses, but we trust in the name of the Lord our God. They collapse and fall, but we rise and stand upright. O oh Lord, save the king, and may he answer us when we call. It's interesting he does not mention prayer once, the word prayer once, but it's obviously a part of David's life and a part of ours as well. So this morning, let's go to prayer and ask this great God to be with us. Let's pray. Oh, our Father, how we thank you that we are here this morning. We thank you, Father, also that you have made prayer a part of the worship service, that we can come to you at any time to give you thanks and bring our petitions. But, Father, oh, you know the days that we have. You know that there are days of trouble, that there are days of worry and anxious thought. Oh, Father, there are so many things that we need but Father, there's also those that need of salvation. And Father, here, even in your word, you say that you will save your anointed. You will save the ones who you have chosen. And so, Father, again this day, how we thank you for that choice. How we thank you, O Lord, that we are found here. That you have given us grace and you have given us mercy to be your children. And so, Father, in this time of prayer this morning, what will we ask? Well, we know what we need. So we will ask that you will send your spirit to us this morning. To Pastor John as he preaches the word, Father, may his words be powerful and forceful as only the scriptures can be. And Father, may you affect each and every heart that we would hear the word of God as we need it, not as others need it. And Father, that we would take it for the truth that it is, and O oh Lord, that you would affect our hearts with it. Thank you again, O oh Lord, for our day together, this one day in seven, how we pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless it to our hearts, that you would bless our fellowship together, and Father, once more, that you would bless the hearing of your word to our hearts. For all this we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please take your blue hymnals and turn them to hymn number 82. Yeah. 
Matthew chapter 27, and we will read the first 23 verses. I was struck by these verses that what seemed to be the main impulse that comes out of these is the dreadful sin sinfulness and the perfect righteousness. We have Christ, of course, with the only one with perfect righteousness. There is so much sin and sinfulness in these first chapters in this chapter that it is uh, hard to ignore. Well, let's read chapter Matthew chapter 27, verse 1. When morning came, all the chief priests and the elders of the people took counsel against Jesus to put him to death. And they bound him and led him away and delivered him over to Pilate the governor. Then when Judas, his betrayer, saw that Jesus was condemned, he changed his mind and brought back the thirty pieces of silver to the chief priests and the elders, saying, I have sinned by betraying innocent blood. They said, What is that to us? See to it yourself. And throwing down the pieces of silver into the temple, he departed and went and hanged himself. But the chief priests, taking the pieces of silver, said, it is not lawful to put them into the treasury, since it is blood money. So they took counsel and bought with them the potter's field as a burial place for strangers. Therefore, that field has been called the field of blood to this day. Then was fulfilled what had been spoken by the prophet Jeremiah, saying, And they took the thirty pieces of silver, the price of him on whom a price had been set by some of the sons of Israel, and they gave them for the potter's field, as the Lord directed him. Now Jesus stood before the governor, and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, You have said so. But when he was accused by the chief priests and elders, he gave no answer. Then Pilate said to him, Do you not hear how many things they testify against you? But he gave him no answer, not even to a single charge, so that the governor was greatly amazed. Now at the feast, the governor was accustomed to release from the crowd any one prisoner whom they wanted. And they had a notorious prisoner called Barabbas. So when they had gathered, Pilate said to them, Whom do you want me to release for you? Barabbas or Jesus, who is called Christ. For he knew that it was out of envy that they had delivered him up. Besides, while he was sitting on the judgment seat, his wife sent word to him, Have nothing to do with that righteous man, for I have suffered much because of him today in a dream. Now the chief priests and the elders persuaded the crowd to ask for Barabbas and destroy Jesus. The governor again said to them, which of the two do you want me to release to you? And they said, Barabbas. Pilate said to them, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Let him be crucified. And he said, Why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, Let him be crucified. We see even here that the crowd who on their own might have asked for Jesus, but the pressure of the elders and chief priest was too much, so they changed their mind. And so did Pilate. Pilate wanted to get rid of this whole episode by finding Jesus innocent, but he wanted too much favor of man, so he, he relented. And he gave Jesus over to be crucified. But the point that really struck me this morning was Judas. He took the blood money, he took the 30 pieces of silver to betray his Lord, and what came of it? J.C. Ryle makes three comments about Judas. He says, first, he says that Judas is plain proof of our Lord's innocence of every charge laid against him. And it's true. What, who would have been the best witness at the trial? Judas. Judas was with him three and a half years, 
and could have easily made up anything he wanted to to convict Christ. But even Judas says, I have sinned in that I betrayed innocent blood. Secondly, Ryle says that there is such a thing as repentance, which is too late. That was Judas. His repentance, obviously, even in these in these in this time here, even though he said I betrayed innocent blood, it wasn't up until it wasn't up to his salvation. He repented of his wrong, but he would never follow Christ. Thirdly, Ryle says, how little comfort ungodliness brings to a man in his last days. And how we all know that it's true. How many have lost friends or parents that have never ever bowed the knee to Christ. And the days for them and their death is not good. There is fear and trembling and horror at passing from this life into the next. It's too bad that Judas didn't realize or understand this the scripture, that your sin will surely find you out. And it did in that day, and he went in pain. Well, these scriptures aren't joyous scriptures, but they certainly are true, that our sin will truly find us out. Well, let's go to prayer again this morning. <clears throat> pray for in the Far East and for their safety, but we also want to thank the Lord for the overturning of the uh, Roe versus Wade issue in the U.S. Uh, we've already seen many, many of the states there overturning that and making abortion absolutely illegal, and we're thankful for that. We don't know where this is all going to end up, but we thank you. Thank you to God for the start of it. And how we would pray that the whole idea would come up into our own country. And that Canada would not be a place of easy abortion, but it would be a place where God's word reigns. And that this would not happen. But let's go to prayer. <coughs> Father, we thank you again that we can come and pray. We thank you, Father, that you hear us. And that your promise in scripture is that you will answer us. We don't know how you will answer. We don't know when you will answer. But Father, we know that you are there. We know that you love us. You care for us. And you will even give us everything that we desire. But Father, our desire this morning is to see these people in the Far East that are doing such good work. That are taking orphans in. Hundreds and hundreds of them. And feeding them. And teaching them your word keeping them safe. But Father, we know also that their war surrounds them. And days it comes right to their gates. But Father, we would ask that those gates would be protected. We pray, O oh Lord, that in their time of need, you would be there for them. Father, we thank you for the friendship that they have made with the generals over the past while. We pray, Father, that that would continue. And yet, Father, we know that War is a thing that is so unpredictable to us. So Lord, they truly must have anxious days and anxious nights. They worry about those things like even getting food. But Father, mostly we'd ask that you would help them, keep them safe. We also pray, Father, for the refugees that are out in the hills, in the mountains, hiding from the army. Father, we know that they want to take these people and execute them, execute them. We know, O oh Lord, that they do not want any good for these refugees. And yet, in your good plan, you have put someone close by who can come and bring the gospel to them, to bring physical things to them as well. But Father, we thank you for that opportunity that these people have to open the Bible and teach them of Christ. Father, may there be many salvations there. Father, we also thank you for that compound that's been erected, that's been moved, we thank you for all the building that's going on and ask, oh Father, that you would see that that buildings, uh, the whole structures would be finished soon and that, oh Lord, they could again come to worship and come to teach the children of your word. But finally also, we would thank you for the uh, missionary's wife who has broken her arm that has had surgery. We would pray for quick healing. We pray, oh Lord, that there would be no complications 
And Father, that she can return back to doing all the work that she has. But Lord, we want to thank you this morning that you in your grace and in your mercy, especially to those people in the, in the United States, that you have overturned this, this terrible law where abortion could be had by almost anyone. Lord, we thank you that as soon as it's been overturned, there's been many hundreds of thousands of people now who will rejoice that this has happened. Rejoice that the babies will not be killed in the womb. And Father, that your anger will not be against them any longer. But Father, we know that in both of our countries that this seems to be called a right. A right to kill your own children. And Father, what a horrid thing that this is. Totally against you and your ways. So Father, we thank you that in this past week you have done such a marvelous work. Lord, we would pray that you would continue, that this would not go just be in the United States, but it would encompass every country in the world. Mm -hmm. That, Father, this would be a practice that would become not a practice. This would be something that would become rare and unusual. Father, the saving of children mm -hmm. is part of your love for the humankind. So, Father, we would ask that your grace and your mercy would be upon even more children, Father, and save their lives. Lord, how we thank you for our day together. How we thank you that you're with us. Father, again, we'd ask that your spirit would fill Pastor John as he comes to preach. And again, oh Lord, we thank you that we are found here this morning. Bless us, Father, we'd ask in Jesus' name. Amen. For our final hymn this morning, let's take our red hymnals and turn to hymn 390. set our hope that he will continue to deliver us.
if you would please take your copies of God's Word and turn with me to the book of Joshua, chapter 24. Joshua 24, we saw last week that Joshua had called the nation, especially its representatives, to come and meet with him in Shechem, and he presented a challenge to them to serve the Lord. We're going to come to this text again this morning, and so let's just read in Joshua 24, verses 14 and 15. Now therefore fear the Lord and serve him in sincerity and in faithfulness. Put away the gods that your fathers served beyond the river and in Egypt and serve the Lord. And if it is evil in your eyes to serve the Lord, choose this day whom you will serve, whether the gods your fathers served in the region beyond the river or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Let's again pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you that you tell us so clearly in your word that everything that was written down in the past was written down for us. And so we can come to this passage and know that Though written thousands of years ago, it was written for us and for our encouragement as the people of God here in 2022. Heavenly Father, we look to you because we know that you alone by your Spirit can impact our lives by your Word. Not a human preacher, not anything apart from your spirit. And so we rely today upon your spirit and pray that this would be a time in which we know the spirit of God among us working in our lives according to that promise of Jesus, that if we ask the Father, you would give to us the Holy Spirit. And so we're asking you this morning, our God, because we know that we need your word in our lives. We want to become more like the Lord Jesus Christ. We want our sins to be put to death and godly virtues to be increased in our lives. Heavenly Father, come and do this for your honor and glory. We pray, Heavenly Father, that we would leave this place knowing that we've met with you here today. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. As we come back to this text of Scripture that we started last week, we're continuing to ask that fundamental question that brought us here, what does it mean to be a godly father? What does it mean to be a godly father? We're obviously camping on this declaration of Joshua as Israel's leader in verse 15. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. It came as a personal and family response to the challenge he had given to all Israel to fear and serve the Lord. It's important that we understand why Joshua had given such a challenge to Israel. Part of the book of Joshua, of Joshua is the description of the dividing up of the land of Canaan for the various 12 tribes. And as the boundaries of the tribes are given, and I acknowledge reading through those sections can be difficult at times as you go from this little town to this mountain and this river, and you think, where on earth are these things? But obviously the land is being divided up into 12 groups, and as the boundaries are being described, 
Usually each section ends with the description of the Canaanite population that had not been driven out of that region. This was clearly contrary to the will of God. The land was to be wiped clean of its inheritance. It was to be the sole possession of the Israelites. <clears throat> and yet they were allowing certain groups to remain in each one of their sections, and these groups were having an influence on the new settlers, the Israelites. For instance, the Israelites were taking some of their idols into their homes and worshiping the gods of the Canaanites. And so this call came from Joshua to the entire nation. Whom are you going to serve? Who's going to be your God? You can't have both. You can't have a little bit for Jehovah or Yahweh, the God of the Bible, and a little bit for these idols, these gods of the Canaanite nations. You have to commit yourself to one or the other. And of course, Joshua's declaration sets the example. He, along with his family, they were going to be committed to worshiping and serving the Lord. They were going to give themselves to do the will of God within this newly conquered land. Now, that sets before us the example of a godly father. Even at an age of 100 to 110, that's what we think Joshua was at this time, he was giving definitive leadership to his family. He was not the kind of man to sit back in his lazy boy and leave it to the younger generation. He was not waffling or hesitant. His was an immediate commitment to the service of God. Now last week as we began to answer this question, what does it mean to be a godly father, our first answer was this. A godly father understands the issues of life. A godly father understands the issues of life. He's a man who knows what's most important and he seeks to impress those things on his family. Now, as we look around ourselves in society, everywhere there are reminders, I think, that men don't get it that men in general don't understand the great issues of life. Many years ago, I remember going to our son Daniel's university graduation. We went to the service and a man was being given an honorary doctorate and he had also been invited to speak. And so here was his chosen address to the graduates. These are, you know, a large group of young people getting ready to go out and live their lives. And he spoke on what would seem to be a very important subject. The six greatest problems facing our world. Now that, of course, made me sit up and listen. Six greatest problems facing our world. What's he going to speak on? Well, these were his themes. Six greatest problems facing our world. Poverty, sanitation, not enough toilets, resulting disease, people having too many babies, and it continued along that line of thinking. Now I don't mean to mock his message because the problem of poverty in our world is a great one. But when a man says that one of the greatest problems in the world are too few toilets, I think he's missed the mark. If it were possible to eradicate poverty and disease and give everyone in the world a clean toilet, the problems of this world would be far from being solved. He didn't understand the great issues of life. Now Joshua did. 
And we looked at them last week. He brought before the nation, he brought before his family, the reality of God. You've got to understand and believe in God. You've got to see God's uh, involvement in your life every day. Your whole life needs to be a response to the reality of God. And then the second issue, that there are only two groups of people in this world, the people of God and the people of the world, and so the need to have a gospel ministry in your home because you know that as your children come into the world, they're part of the people of God, uh, the people of the world, and you want them to become part of the people of God. The third issue of exclusive allegiance you can't become a Christian and say, I'm just going to give Jesus Christ a little part of my life. You have to give him your all. And that fourth issue of service to God. The Israelites in the Old Testament, it meant building the kingdom of God in Israel, taking the word of God and applying it to all of their lives. And of course today, the issue of commitment to the local church. How am I going to serve Jesus Christ? in a local body. So that first answer, what does it mean to be a godly father? You have to understand the issues of life. So it's not the best hermeneutics, but we start with point number two this morning because this is really a continuation from last week. What does it mean to be a godly father? Answer number two, a godly father is a man who is committed to working on his own life. A man who is a godly father is a man who is committed to working on his own life. You notice how Joshua begins this famous declaration, as for me and my house, as for me. Before he commits his family to anything, he commits himself. Before he challenges his family about serving God and fearing God, he challenges himself. Joshua was a man who recognized that a father must be an example. Not only must he know and understand the great issues of life and teach these things to his family, he must have a personal conviction. And that personal conviction must be seen clearly in his own life. He must be a man who is committed to working on himself, even if he's 110 years old. That's amazing. Surely we think, well, you get to 80, if you get to 90, if you get to 100, you've probably got it all worked out. Joshua didn't believe that. As for me, I've got to keep working on myself. These issues of fearing and serving the Lord, I've got to continually challenge myself with these matters. He was committed to working on himself. How easy it is for men to recognize the problems in their family members around them. Men can often pinpoint for you what is wrong with their wife. If only she would be like this, if she would change in this manner in our family. The same is true of their children. They can quickly identify for you the problems in their children's lives. But how difficult is it for us to look at ourselves as men and say, I'm the one who needs to be worked on. I'm the one with the problems. I'm the sinner. I'm the one with a shallow commitment. It takes humility to be a godly father and say, I need working on. And it takes determination to look at yourself and say, where are the areas that need to be worked on in my life? Where do I need to grow in grace? Where does my understanding and commitment need to be strengthened? As we look at Joshua, 
We see the example of a godly father. We recognize that he was prepared to work on himself. What were the things he was committed to with reference to himself? Well, we can say, first of all, that he was committed to the priority of the Word of God in his life. He was committed to the priority of the Word of God in his life. If you would take your Bibles and turn back to the very beginning of Joshua, chapter 1. Joshua, chapter 1. Here we're introduced to Joshua's leadership and his opening challenge from God. Joshua 1, and we'll begin at verse 1 down to verse 9. After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, the Lord said to Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' assistant, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all this people, into the land that I am giving to them, to the people of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given to you, just as I promised to Moses. From the wilderness of this Lebanon, as far as the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites to the great sea, toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. Just as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you or forsake you. Be strong and courageous, for you shall cause this people to inherit the land that I swore to their fathers to give them. Only be strong and very courageous, being careful to do according to all the law that Moses, my servant, commanded you. Do not turn from it to the right hand or to the left, that you may have good success wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have good success. Have I not commanded you? Be strong and courageous, do not be frightened, and do not be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Now, here at the beginning of Joshua's leadership in Israel, there were things that must have been incredibly overwhelming to Joshua as he took up this work. As reminded in these verses, there was the overwhelming shadow of Moses. Moses had been such an incredible leader for the Israelites in 40 years. So much had been accomplished under God's blessing by his hand. He was a giant in terms of spiritual leadership, and Joshua now was to fill his shoes. That must have been overwhelming. But what, there was the immensity of the task as well. Here they were, a ragtag group of about two million people going into a settled country with great walled cities and armaments and armies and kings. And they were supposed to overwhelm it all and drive everyone out. How could they do that? The fear of the enemies, even the giants that lived in the end. Here were men who would stand against them, whether the giants or men within his own ranks who would be rebellious. So here was the work he was to take up. Joshua was in essence the political leader and the general of the army of Israel. It was a great task. And what was the recipe for success? How would Joshua know success as he led Israel and as he led those armies to overwhelm the Canaanites and take the land for God and build the kingdom of God? What was the recipe for success? Personal commitment to the priority of the Word of God in his life. Verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. 
It's got to be close to you, as close as in your mouth every day. Meditate on it day and night. Be careful to do it all that is written in it. Personal commitment to the Word of God. This was not just a general commitment. I'm going to serve God. I'm going to live for God. God was very specific in his instructions to Joshua. He had to know the Word. He had to meditate on the Word. He had to be thinking on it constantly. And he had to be obedient to the Word. Living it out in everything he did. Joshua had to be a man of the book. He had to be thinking about it. He had to be living it out. That was the way to God's promised lesson. The lesson ought to be very clear. If we want to be godly fathers, the only way to accomplish that is by making the Word of God a great priority in our lives. We must make a commitment to read it, to meditate on it, and to obey it. To read it is not enough. There must be thought through the day, and then there must be conscious obedience. <clears throat> I think there's a temptation for Christians to say, well, we hear pastors preaching to us, you've got to be in the Word of God. And we can understand that that's good for you. You know, you've got to be preaching and you've got to be ministering to people. So you've got to be in the Word of God every day. We understand that. But, but our jobs are different. You know, maybe I'm a plumber or maybe I'm working for the city or, or maybe I'm in a medical office or something else. So it's not so important for me. Yeah, I have a little bit of the Word of God every day, I, I know, but... Joshua was a politician, and he was an army general. And God said, if you're going to have success, you have to make the Word of God the priority in your life. Reading it, meditating on it, obeying it. So often Christians complain, well, I don't remember what I read. And we need to remember that learning the scriptures isn't going to be automatic. You don't just read a passage and then remember. You've often experienced reading a passage and then later in the day if someone asks you what you read, you, you struggle to bring it back. We have to deal with that. We're obviously all dealing with memories that are getting older and the issue of forgetfulness is there. More importantly, we're all dealing with remaining sin that wants to encourage forgetfulness. We're not aware of how sin in our hearts works to try and blot out what we read from the Bible through the course of the day. So if the scriptures are going to become a prominent fixtures in our minds and hearts, it will only happen because of conscious determination. You have to have a plan to remember. You have to come up with some means to accomplish it. It might be just forcing your memory in the middle of the day. What did I read this morning? It might mean writing a, a brief summary of what you've just read as a means of remembering. It might be memorizing a verse like Joshua 1 and verse 8, and keeping that in your mind through the course of the day. And then so important, praying over what you have read, and turning what you have read in the scriptures to prayer in terms of your own life or the life of God's kingdom in the world. This is essential for developing godly fathers as in any other area of life. As we read and give our attention to the Word of God, it becomes a means of conviction. And that's how we're going to find out what's wrong in our lives. If we're really committed to this fact, I'm not perfect, I'm far from perfect, so I've got to work on myself. Well, what's wrong with me? Well, the Bible will show you. 
God is faithful. If you're coming to the scriptures and saying, Lord, show me me and show me what's wrong with me and what I need grace for to change, the Bible will be there as a means of conviction. It will show you the paths of righteousness that the Lord wants you to walk in for our leadership, for our fathering, for working in business, for being a faithful husband. It will clarify our service to Christ in the church. It will stir up our zeal. We've got to be committed to the priority of the Word of God in our lives. But then secondly, Joshua was a man who knew what it meant to meet with God. Joshua was a man who knew what it meant to meet with God. Now you might wonder at this point, isn't that what reading the Bible is all about? Why a separate point here? Well, if you've lived very long as a Christian, you know exactly what I'm going to say. It's easy to read your Bible and not meet with God. It's easy to read your Bible and not really meet with God. How often do you have your personal devotions and come away with a sense of meeting with God. So if someone asks you, did you read your Bible this morning, you would say yes. Someone asks you, did you meet with God, I'm not sure about that. But that's what we're supposed to be doing. We can read our Bibles, we can even spend time in prayer, and still come away with having really spent time in the presence of God. I want you to consider Joshua's experience over in chapter 5. You turn there with me. Joshua 5. There, just before the great city of Jericho. This would be their first challenge, having come into the land of Canaan. And what a great challenge it was, because Jericho was one of the greatest of the cities in Canaan. And so we read in Joshua 5, verse 13. When Joshua was by Jericho, he lifted up his eyes, and behold, a man was standing before him with his drawn sword in his hand. And Joshua went to him and said to him, Are you for us or for our adversaries? And he said, No, but I am the commander of the army of the Lord. Now I have come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshipped and said to him, What does my Lord say to his servant? And the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, Take off your sandals from your feet, for the place where you are standing is holy. And Joshua did so. So here he's preparing for the attack on Jericho. And as general of the army, he's out sort of doing his own reconnaissance. He's looking at the lay of the land and the territory that they're going to be taking over. And as he does this, he has this strange and unusual meeting. We're told that he met a man. And yet very clearly this man must have been God appearing in the form of a man because in verse 15 he hears the very same words that Moses heard standing in front of the burning bush back in the wilderness. Take off your sandals from your feet for the place where you are standing is holy. God had come to meet with Joshua. At first, Joshua didn't know who it was, and so he asked, Are you on our side, or are you on the enemy's side? When he discovers that this man, this person, is the commander of the army of the Lord, the one who is in charge, Joshua falls on his face to worship him. He was in the presence of majesty. He was being confronted with a God who is altogether holy, and the only fitting response was to put his face in the earth and worship. Now, if you're going to be a godly father, that kind of experience cannot be foreign to you. Now, I'm not trying to say that you're going to have exactly the same kind of experience that Joshua did, 
that someday you'll be out walking in the woods and all of a sudden God will meet you in the form of a man. I'm not saying that. But I am saying that if you want to be a godly father, you are going to have experiences of God. And we look for those through the normal means of grace that God has spelled out in his word. For instance, our personal devotions. When we come to God reading his word and in prayer, and we seek him in such a way that we have this sense of, God is here with me. And I'm communicating with the living God. We often come to these times that our souls can be dull. It can be helpful to read a hymn or even a short devotional to sort of prime the pump of our devotions. But then to open your Bible and read and pray in such a way that your whole purpose is to meet with God. You're seeking Him. You're asking for His presence. You're pouring out your soul before Him. And when you come like that, and your stated purpose is to seek the Lord, He's going to reward you. And you're going to have experiences with God. You will have times when you just want to get down on your face and worship. You will have times when you're overwhelmed with your sins and you're crying out to God and pleading the precious blood of the Lord Jesus for forgiveness. There will be other times when you are overwhelmed with the reality of His grace and mercy to you as an undeserving sinner. Brethren, is there ever that holy glow in your soul when you come from the private place of meeting with God? That is what will change you. That will make you into a godly father. That will give you such a strength to your commitment that it will affect others around you. Brethren, if we're going to work on ourselves, these are the two areas that Joshua's example set before us. The priority of Scripture in our lives and the pursuit of God. We want to have experiences of God that conclude in adoring wonder before the majesty of our God. Now that brings us to our third major and final point. We've already looked at a godly father understands the issues of life. A godly father is determined to work on himself. Now thirdly, a godly father is committed to influencing his children throughout the course of his life. A godly father is committed to influencing his children throughout the course of his life. Now surely part of the incredible nature of this text and the testimony that's before us in Joshua 24 is his age, 100 to 110, still leading, still the general, still the patriarch of his family. Our modern generation may be ashamed of this word patriarch. Joshua was a patriarch, and it's the kind of man we need to want to be patriarchs in our family. Here's a man, over a hundred, he's still giving leadership to his family. He hasn't succumbed to the modern notion that once your children have become teenagers, fathering is over. Or once your children are married, you have no right to say anything to them anymore. Joshua was a patriarch in the truest sense of the word. He was a father until the day he died, and he kept exercising that leadership until his final breath. Now a wise father is going to understand that he can't father his married son the way he fathered him when he was a toddler. But that doesn't mean he stops fathering him 
just because he's out of the house. The fifth commandment of the Ten Commandments given to children, honor your father and mother, doesn't have a time limit attached to it. Very clearly, God has established the authority structure of a family for a lifetime. And even though marriage brings a leaving of mom and dad and a cleaving to a new partner, the influence of a father and mother is meant to continue. Joshua's declaration gives evidence to this. Now as you think about Joshua 24 and this picture and this challenge, what a family picture it would have made. There's the old patriarch, and maybe his wife still standing beside him. And his children are there with their spouses, and their children, and their children. It could be that in this family picture, if Joshua was 110, there might have been great, great grandchildren. So it would have made for an incredible family picture. And as he looks over this brood, this family that God has given to him, he's able to say, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Wouldn't you like to have such a family picture? Well, you must be committed to influencing your family like Joshua until the day that you die. How can you do that? There are three areas, and I just mentioned them briefly. Three powers that God has given to us to accomplish what we see with Joshua and his family. First of all, there's the power of example. The power of example. Does your family see you putting into practice the example of Joshua? Does your family see you committed to a prayer closet? Do they see in your life the fruit of a life lived in the presence of God, of a man experiencing God? Do they see the kind of humility that makes a man work on himself before he tries to correct others? so you can have the power of example. But then there's secondly, the power of prayer. Brethren, are you praying? And are you praying for your family? Are you believing that God is able to change your family as you pray? Are you believing that God is able to save your children, whether they're young or old? Are you, uh, are you understanding that God is able to take your children and make them into valuable members of the Church of Christ? Are you striving with God in prayer until you get the blessing of God? The power of prayer, we all have that. And then thirdly and finally, the power of the Gospel. The power of the Gospel. As a father or as a mother, the most important thing you can do is give your home the scent of Christ. You want your home to smell like the gospel. You want your home to smell like Christ. Our wives often are busy making our homes smell good in physical ways. It's our responsibility as leaders to make sure that our home smells good spiritually. By living as men who have been changed by the gospel, so that the gospel is doing things in our lives every day. By using opportunities to present the gospel at gatherings in your home. Making sure that Christ has the prominent position in your home that he ought to have. I know often in 
past generations, there were those plaques that Christians would put on their walls about Christ being the unseen guest in our home. And I was actually reading that it used to be tradition for people to leave an empty chair. And that would be a reminder that Christ is here as our guest, the Lord of our home. You may not do that. You don't have to do that. You don't have to have a plaque on the wall. But you ought to, by example, by prayer, by influence, by your words, make it clear to all that Christ is Lord of our family, and it's our determination to serve Him. The task of being a godly father is an awesome responsibility. We've been looking at Joshua, but the person we need to go to most of all is Jesus Christ. Because as Joshua stands there, an important example and pattern for us, Joshua can't give us the power to do any of those things. Mm. But the New Testament Joshua, mm. Jesus, he's the one who is able to empower us to do everything. We can look at these things, we can listen to these things and say, Lord, I'm a failure as a father, or how weak I am as a father. How often have I failed to do these things? Well, Jesus Christ can cleanse you. He can take all of these things away. He can empower us. He can make us all that we need to be, whether early on in our parenting or whether... We're just seeking to parent from a distance now. Brethren, I hope you look at the example and say, I want to be a godly father. Then don't let these messages die. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Not because I'm sorry. But keep looking at Joshua in Joshua 24, this declaration, and keep praying, Lord Jesus, how can I become more like this example? Empower me. Give me all that I need to be to be a godly man. And Jesus Christ will do that for you. You just have to ask. It's just like conversion, becoming a Christian. How do you become a Christian? You ask Jesus Christ to save you. You ask him to change you. You ask him to cleanse you of your sins and make you a new man. And there's a sense in which we have to keep praying that kind of prayer every day. Lord Jesus, I need you to cleanse me. I need you to empower me. I need you to walk with me. I need you to help me to be the kind of man that I need. May the Lord give us grace to respond and say thank you for the example of Joshua. Make me like this man. Lord Jesus, give me the power that I don't have myself. Let's bow in prayer. Heavenly Father, you can't just look out at the world and think that they've gotten it all wrong. Because we know that the only reason that we have some, even a little right thinking, is because of your grace. We know that just right thinking isn't going to make us the people that we need to be. We need right thinking turned into right actions by your grace. And we know that that is never accomplished in our own power. Oh, our God, as you have worked mightily to save us, would you work mightily to change us, to give us that will, work in our wills, that we might will and work according to your good pleasure. Oh, our Father, we believe that this present generation 
needs godly men, godly fathers, godly patriarchs. And would you help us to have such courage and boldness in Christ? And Father, may we exercise these powers, the power of example and the power of prayer, and most of all, the power of the gospel. May that be evident in our lives. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.